would say is my claim to fame is I have been around for a very long time. Um, just a few things kind of to get us oriented. I don't have any disclosures to make, um, but I do have um, a few disclaimers for lack of a better word. This is a huge topic that we're gonna tackle here, really, really important and something that um, if all of you do pursue your path to psychiatry, um, working with folks with symptoms of bipolar and borderline is something that you'll do every day. Um, and it'll be one of the more challenging things that you do, um, but also one of the more rewarding. So I hope that's what you walk away with. Um, my thanks are to some of my colleagues. Um, you guys know this, but part of presenting is just shamelessly borrowing good ideas from other people. And just as happenstance, one of my colleagues, a psychiatrist by the name of Vassar Chenick, gave a wonderful pre Grand Rounds presentations about the neurobiology of borderline disorder, like weeks before you guys reached out. And he graciously has shared um, some of his information with me. Um, so my, my last request is, I think that talks are much more productive when they're interactive than me just droning on. It's a little difficult in this format. Um, I have the chat open, so please, as you have questions, comments, um, epiphanies even, utilize the chat frequently. Um, I'd also ask you to, I cannot see any of you, but I would ask you to um, put your videos on and arrange your screen so that you can see each other and utilize the, um, the hands raised with, if you have questions that you want to jump in and Marissa can call on you because um, she's agreed to, to uh, kind of monitor that. Okay, so I think that's all the, the, the pre-stuff. So I would like to start out with a little bit of a reflection. And if you can, I would ask you to use the chat for this. I want you to think about the most memorable patient with borderline disorder that you've worked with. And just without opening, what was the thing that made that person or person stick in your head? Yeah, that's scary, Marissa. Yeah, the unpredictability, the vulnerability, the suicidality. Yeah, the behaviors that don't necessarily make sense from our cognitive and affective standpoint. Help me, help me, no, don't help me. Yeah. Incredibly high utilizers. Um, really with the splitting, really taking its toll on the, on the team. So one of the things that I am noticing, and I suspect you are too, is that with a couple of commonalities with the suicidality, um, the things that are sticking out to people really, really cover a large range. And that's pretty emblematic of this thing that we call personality disorders. And you guys know this, but I just wanted to put a reminder. Um, Personality basically embraces everything about how we interact with the world and with other human beings. And if that's not working right, it impacts everything and it shows up um, 
over and over and over again in different scenarios and in different ways. So, you know, as I do want to talk a little bit about the history of borderline disorder and how we got to where we are, because we have to know history to go forward. Um, it is my personal opinion that with the possible exception of Spanish flu and China flu, the term borderline personality wins the prize for the worst nomenclature in medicine. Um, but here's a little bit about how it came out. Um, in the early days of psychiatric diagnosis, our paintbrush was really broad and it started out basically, basically psychotic or not psychotic. That was, that was the, first, uh, the first delineation. And within the not psychotic, there was, we, there was this realm that we came to call neurosis. And that covered everything, anxiety, um, poor resilience, poor coping, depression, just about everything. So the psychotic, not psychotic was the mindset of when people first started noticing this group of people that just didn't function well. And they, they started out being called the borderline group because the emphasis was on the, the tendency of folks with severe borderline disorder to decompensate into episodes of psychosis. So the borderline was initially the borderline between neurosis and psychosis. Um, Helen Deutsch, which I think was a very per, per, perceptive um, approach, described them the, as the as if personality because they would kind of um, morph in, depending on what relationship they were in. Um, then we got into the 40s, 50s, 60s, a greater element of ego psychology and the borderline states was still sort of the commonly accepted um, consideration. Um, the real work and, and research about borderline personality disorder started with Otto Kernberg. Um, and, and he developed as this midpoint between um, psychosis and neurosis, um, but really started to drill down into the roles and patterns of um, psychological defenses and defining these group of folks who looked pretty well put together on the surface, but were functioning on very primitive, immature defenses. Um, splitting was one that came up in the, in the initial. Um, and then um, John Gunderson and Roy Grinker, I'm, a, I'm suspecting these names are familiar to you, really started to do the first borderline research. Um, it wasn't until 1980 the borderline disorder um, ended up in the DSM. And then in 1993, Marshall Linehan um, introduced the concept of DBT and the, the good research on that. Um, this was revolutionary. Guys, I cannot emphasize how important this was because prior to this point, there had been an assumption throughout the psychiatric world that borderline personality is untreatable. And, you know, this came about for a few reasons. One was um, back in the beginning when borderline disorder was seen as sort of a mild version almost of schizophrenia, schizophrenia was felt to be untreatable. Um, and then when psychoanalysis was the primary, if not only mode of treatment, um, it quickly became apparent that folks with severe borderline disorder did terrible in analysis because the whole point of that was to strip down your defenses, let your anxiety blossom and promote personality change. Well, folks with borderline disorder, they would either become psychotic or their anger and interpersonal issues um, would overtake the therapy. So this concept that we actually have a good effect effective and accessible treatment for folks with borderline was revolutionary. And then in 2008, um, National Borderline Personality Awareness Month was named. I only put that in there as a recognition of what an impact this particular illness has on, um, on folks. Um, however, there isn't universal agreement, and we've pretty much been fighting um, since the, the name was termed 
about what borderline disorder is. There are some camps who see it as a disorder of affect, um, clearly on the bipolar spectrum. There are other camps with just as firmly held views who consider it a disorder of affective regulation and more on the spectrum with impulsivity disorders. And that would be things like substance use, antisocial personality, um, impulse control, gambling disorders, those sorts of things. Um, as a matter of fact, there is a growing chorus of voices who are suggesting that the name it would be more appropriately changed to affective um, regulation disorder. Okay, so let's go back in time to the mid 1800s. This dapper looking gentleman is Emil Krapelin. You probably know him. You've probably seen questions on your uh, on your shelf exams about um, Dr. Krapelin. He was one of our um, one of our benchmarks um, diagnosticians in psychiatry um, in his approach to psychosis. So remember, psychotic, non-psychotic. Within the psychosis realm, um, back then it really was, was this infectious or non-infectious? Infectious was mainly syphilis, but not, but not exclusively. And within the non-infectious realm, Krapelin's great contribution was kind of sorting out what he called dementia praecox, which we, was a forerunner of schizophrenia, to what he termed manic depressive psychosis or manic depressive insanity, um, MDI is, is uh, how it's abbreviated sometimes. And said people would get manic, sometimes with depression, sometimes not. And he really didn't emphasize that whether it was mania or mood swings or depression, what Krapelin's emphasis was the episodic nature of it and the period sometimes very lengthy of euthymia in between um, episodes as opposed to the chronicity of dementia praecox. Um, and he also emphasized the motor aspects because even back then he believed that there was something going on in these folks' brains. So if we look at it in, through our lens of DSM, what Krapelin described would be bipolar one, bipolar two, and recurrent melancholic depression. Um, now, you know, when we read the history books, it seems very concrete, but um, I've, I've read sort of real time journal excerpts of this era and, you know, the fighting over psych psychiatric and nosological theories back then was just as prominent as it is now. Um, only they said it in more gentlemanly, gentle personly language in the, uh, in the journals. So this concept of polarity, um, unipolar or bipolar depression, really didn't come up until the mid 20th century, a guy named Carl Leonard. Um, that's when we started looking at unipolar versus bipolar. Um, and it showed up in DSM-3 in 1980, same year as borderline disorder. Um, and this, this was another big step in where we are in bipolar spectrum. Um, DSM divided it into bipolar disorder and major depression. But within major depression, they took out the concept of we use, what we used to call neurotic depression and then put severe melancholic depression and neurotic depression under the same MDD umbrella. So Krapelin's original concept became divided into bipolar disorder and major depression. And major depression got expanded to include a large number of folks with a very common, very nonspecific symptom profile that wasn't in the, the original. So this is our journey to where we are in, in bipolar spectrum. And then, you know, the, the literature and the discussion about bipolar spectrum actually goes back to the, uh, to the late 70s. And the most prolific writer and proponent of the spectrum concept is a gentleman named um, Hagop Akiskel. And he again went back to Krapelin in, uh, in, in his rationale. He proposed a number of subsets of bipolar disorder. 
um, one, one and a half, two, two and a half, three. So full disclosure, I stole these next two slides from the internet. I have no idea I credit who made them because um, it wasn't listed. This is just a pictorial version of those listings that, that A. Kiskel describes, and it's easier to um, understand in a picture. So where it says stronger, these are the, the subsets of bipolar disorder that have much more um, acceptance um, in, the, in the psychiatric community and actually live in DSM. So bipolar one, you know, bipolar two, hypomania of at least four days, bipolar NOS, or what we sometimes call cyclothymic disorder, the, you know, you're still having ups and downs, antidepressant related um, hypomania hypomania or mania. And then you get into the more nebulous patterns. Um, what a Kisco calls the hyperthermic personality. This one is a huge challenge to me. Um, number, number one, because it's almost impossible to get a longitudinal history from someone um, about how about um, hyperthermia, unless you get a lot of good collateral information. It also, well, the, the concept of hyperthermia, which is just general um, levels of irritability, high maintenance, high strung, that sort of thing. Um, it also raises questions about where people fall on the spectrum between pathology and normality, which is way beyond our, our scope for today. And the last thing that is included in this bipolar spectrum rubric that makes our job more difficult is folks with recurrent depression, no mania, who just don't respond to antidepressants. And where do they fit in? So in, in this model, mood lability is the key. It's the most powerful predictor of, of who's going to develop frank hypomania or mania. Easy, right? The problem with that is mood liability is just ubiquitous. I have ne never met Dr. Gamey, but I read his uh, stuff throughout the years. He's a very uh, insightful psychiatrist. And I love this quote, liability along with anxiety is the fever of psychiatry. Um, it kind of drives everything or as a result of everything. So we have all of these um, criteria that have been proposed in studies under the umbrella of bipolar spectrum, may or may not have mania or hypomania, may or may not have major depression, a lot of instability, recurrence, liability, and a family history. Um, does anybody see any challenges with the direction we're going here? The whole may or may not is quite confusing. Is it though? And a little bit nebulous. Yeah. Family history of bipolar. Well, family history of what? As we're expanding the, the umbrella. Um, and this, this is psychiatry's diagnostic challenge right now. Because you might be saying to yourself, holy moly, with this wide umbrella, is everybody in the world going to have bipolar disorder? Um, and there's some evidence that we're kind of creeping there. Um, so this is data from the, from the 1990s, looking at the rates of diagnosis um, of bipolar disorder. And look at those slopes, um, especially that dark line is in children. Um, so this is outpatients. This is same time frame, only in hospitalized inpatients. So you see the rate of rise of increase. Um, something interesting on this bottom um, box, which is adults, the yellow lines are, are Caucasian patients, male or female. Um, one of the things that we know about bipolar disorder from day one is that it tends to have an equal male to female distribution. Don't ask me why the diagnostic rates 
have such a great, have a big um, split between um, white males and white females. But you see the rates going up. Um, I have seen data after the mid 2000s where it does seem to plateau off. So there's, there's always a lot of factors going on. Um, one is the concept of bipolar spectrum. Um, one that we, re I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here, but we just in psychiatry always have to have a healthy respect for the, the interactions whenever there are drugs that are being marketed and promoted um, and sometimes really helpful at the same time. And, and obviously the, the atypicals were um, coming into prominence along the same time frame. So, you know, here's kind of our dilemma in the law of unintended consequences. The construct, if you think about it, makes sense because we've all seen patients who are suffering terribly that don't fit into neat categories. But it comes at a cost, and the cost is some erosion of diagnostic integrity with the ever with the expanding diagnosis. And you know, how do you do research if you don't have firm diagnostic criteria? Um, it's confusing for doctors and patients. And I put this last part there, not entirely tongue in cheek, about making psychiatry look foolish, because we do kind of have a history of getting ahead of our skis in diagnosis uh, sometimes. And it does put us at a little risk there. Now, I want to temper that, you know, in fairness, in psychiatry, our diagnostic challenge is really, really hard, because we don't have blood tests, we don't have diagnostic neuroimaging, we have behaviors. At least at this point, that could change by the time you guys get to uh, get into practice. Um, and again, things are fuzzy, but these people are suffering. This is one, one of the first studies that, that included those sub-threshold folks. Um, this chart is just level of impairment. Um, so look at how impaired these, uh, these folks are with the sub-threshold um, symptoms. Um, you know, I am gonna share some data and of course, methodology is important. Some of the research that's out there does a pretty good job of identifying what they're talking about with bipolar, one, two spectrum. Other studies do not. I am not pouring through all of this with a fine tooth comb because your eyes glaze over. Um, in the data that I'm going to show, if the studies do differentiate, I, I try to include that. Um, most of the research out there is on bipolar one and two and very little on this other category, which of course is our primary clinical challenge. So just in terms of epidemiology, um, Bipolar 1 and 2, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1%, though that's been stable no matter how you look at it. The sub-threshold, oh, anywhere between 2 and 3%, depending on how you, how you define it. Um, bipolar disorder, in, you know, in the, in the general population, it's been pretty stable at 1% to 2%. Interestingly, over the years, as this discussion has taken place, we have not seen the same increase in the rate of diagnosis for bipolar disorder. But if you look in um, the setting, primary care, outpatient mental health, inpatient, the, the preponderance of uh, percentage of bipolar of uh, borderline patients goes up because um, they do tend to be very symptomatic and very high utilizers. Uh, you know, genetics, some similarities, um, they both probably have an epigenetic transmission. And what that means is just there's some genes um, that, are, that are involved, but we don't have the whole picture and they interact with a lot of other things. Um, both operate under what we call the stress diathesis. That you probably have some combination of genetics and neurocircuitry um, coupled with childhood experiences, trauma being the best example, and then symptoms coming out during stress or adverse experiences. Um, lots of genetic loci identify for both of these disorders. They do not overlap. They're not the same loci. 
Um, just, I put that up there just because it fascinates me. Um, bipolar patients who respond to lithium may have a very different genetic profile than, uh, than those who don't. So by, by the time y'all are in practice, you might have a good genetic test to help drive the, the um, treatment of bipolar um, patients. That would be game, a game changer. Um, we know both of these illnesses run in families. If um, folks with bipolar have lots of it in their families. Um, patients with bipolar disorder, though, actually have more depression and impulse control disorders in their families than they do bipolar disorder. Um, bipolar disorder, probably the strongest argument, maybe with the exception of schizophrenia for a genetic component. Um, with the twin studies, look at those amazingly high rates of concordance. Um, you know, when the human genome got mapped, we were absolutely convinced we were going to find the gene for bipolar disorder. And of course, that didn't happen. So that's it for genetics. Um, you know, both of these are huge um, comorbid disorders, lots of comorbidity. Here's an interesting sort of pattern, though. For folks with borderline disorder, about 20% of them are going to have comorbid border, uh, bipolar disorder. 10% bipolar 1, 10% bipolar 2. However, they're going to have a higher rate of comorbidity that's not bipolar disorder. Flip it around, folks with bipolar disorder, about 10% of them will have uh, borderline, uh, bipolar ones will have borderline, about 20% of bipolar twos. But borderline is not the most common personality disorder. Um, I am gonna take a look at the, um, we've been kind of going through a lot um, I am going to sort of stop here. Please stand up, stretch, do some jumping jacks if you need to. Um, if anyone does have any questions at this point, this would be a good stopping point for them. I'll ask a question. Um, do you think these overlaps between bipolar, bipolar and borderline personality is why I feel like it's a common misconception for people to think that bipolar disorder is more on the mood swing spectrum when that's actually more consistent with borderline? It seems to be like a common misconception of the general public is interchanging those terms. Yeah, um, it is a common, I, you are absolutely right. It is a common misconception of the general public. And I think we have to own some contribution to that, um, partly because, you know, psychiatric diagnosis is not completely made up. There is a, there is a significant amount of um, pretty solid research that goes into the DSM. But when it translates into actually working with patients and managing patients and managing volume, sometimes we, we do things as quickly as we can. And, and being more general in symptoms is one of those things that we do. The other thing that has contributed to that is, you know, we do, we do want to educate the general public and public service messages, announcements have really blurred that distinction and given the impression that mood swings, um, volatility are really the same as a person having hypomanic um, and manic symptoms. Um, you'll see that every time you turn on the TV. The other thing, and this is psychiatry's cross to bear, um, Sometimes our diagnosis is driven by external factors um, for a variety of reasons. Partly is this conception for many years that borderline disorder was untreatable. Partly it's the phenomenon that folks with borderline disorders can be very, very difficult to work with sometimes and can generate um, a lot of countertransference in the providers. 
um, I think we just are, are more comfortable diagnosing someone as bipolar than as borderline because then you don't have to have the conversation. And with for a long time with, bi, with, with bipolar, it's like, yeah, we can write a script for that. You know, we can do something about that. So all of those things have led us to, to this place. Hopefully we'll do better. Your generation will do better. Any other questions before we press on? Okay, well, if you do have something, just chat out or shout out. I wanna talk a little bit about the brain. Um, you know, we do know a little bit about what goes on in the brains of folks with bipolar disorder. Um, reductions in a whole bunch of places in gray matter, primarily though the insula and the anterior cingulate. And those are the two areas that are on the graphic on your right. Um, also some kind of white matter hyperintensity, but honestly don't know if that's artifact or not. Again, just a little fun fact, um, in bipolar patients who are lithium responders, their cortex and their limbic system looks much more like healthy controls. Um, something exciting there. So switch the topic to the brain and folks with borderline disorders. Um, same thing, they've got a lot of um, reduction in gray matter volume, some of it in the anterior cingulate, um, a lot of it in the, in the limbic system. But, you know, tell me a psychiatric disorder that does not have reduction in gray matter volume. So that's, in my mind, not entirely helpful. However, this study, it, it was small. I think that N was 20-something, uh, all told. This group looked specifically at structural MRI imaging of um, a group of patients with bipolar disorder. Most of them were bipolar one. I think just a couple of them had bipolar two. So none of them on that fuzzy end of the spectrum and compared it with a group of patients with diagnosed borderline disorder. So what you're looking at here, the top box is the patients with bipolar disorder. And in that top box, the brains in the top row are gray matter um, with volume reduction. So the, the, the more yellow or orange or red, the greater the levels of volume reduction. And then the bottom row of brains is changes in white matter. So if you look at those brains of bipolar patients, um, lots of cortical and precortical volume reduction, kind of spread all over the place, more finite blips in the white matter. The bottom box is the brains of people with borderline disorder. Um, so not much going on in the gray matter. And the activity in the white does tend to be, for the most part, more clustered around the, the uh, limbic system. This next, this slide here is the same group of patients, only they were compared with normal controls. So again, looking at the bipolar patients on the top, whatever is going on in their brains is very different than than um, well, <laughs> Marissa, I'm looking at your cat, very different than the well population. Um, and then if you look down at the bottom, that's the patients with borderline disorder, their brains also look very, very different than the general population. Um, this study, although it was small, is kind of a sentinel work for two reasons. Um, partly because it really does challenge the notion that borderline disorder and bipolar disorder are, are the same family just because their brains look pretty different. The other thing is it kind of cements for folks that still didn't really believe that borderline disorder is a biological condition. Um, 
it really is just one more piece of evidence that there is something different in the brains of um, these unfortunate souls that have board, that have borderline. A um, couple other things that are important for you to know, and we're still I'm talking about borderline patients here, about the, the factors that lead to the emotional dysregulation. So the pictures that you have in front of you are brains with some of the major centers identified that have to do with impulsivity, hyperreactivity, distorted interrelationship thinking, and pain processing, because um, that becomes a factor too. So you can kind of see where they're located. Um, it's not a coincidence that you have that cluster around the limbic system, and that's kind of where the borderline brains were, were lighting up on those slides. So just in general, doesn't matter how, how healthy you are psychologically, we keep our emotional thermostat in check within a variety of ways. Um, one is called cortical inhibition. So your limbic system, particularly your alindama, uh, amygdala, spends its entire life 24 seven looking for danger, um, looking for threats. Um, think about it. Um, from an evolutionary standpoint, we gotta know if danger's coming to stay alive. Um, here's an interesting digression. Um, from an evolutionary standpoint, happiness is not necessary. Um, we think it's important, we strive for it, but if you look at the survival of the species, it's not a requirement. But knowing if there's a threat is a requirement. So your amygdala is always on the lookout. Your um, cortical and subcortical regions are always saying, okay, let's think this through. Is it really a danger? No, that wasn't a gunshot. That was a car backfiring. Um, no, my supervisor doesn't really hate me. They were just giving me good advice to help me be a better doctor when they told me that I wasn't perfect when I interviewed that patient. It's always a balance. Um, if you haven't already been educated about resilience and avoidance of burnout, um, you soon will be and you will learn that this balance is, is almost 75% of what we do to keep healthy. So that's just nor just everybody. However, think about it if you have a borderline brain and your amygdala is constantly on overdrive, never shuts down, and instead of scanning the environment for threats is always looking under rocks for them and finding them when maybe they're not there. Um, the one of the things that we that we look at in terms of threat assessment is the concept of saliency and saliency means how meaningful is that threat to me should i be a little bit worried should i be in freak out mode um, one of the things that we know is in folks with borderline disorder they have real difficulties with modulating salience so every threat is is a is a is magnified. The area where um, folks with borderline disorder seem to struggle the most with salience is with other human beings' faces. Think about how challenging this must be to navigate relationships. Um, so in a patient with borderline disorder. If someone has an angry face or just is perceived to have an angry face, their eyes go there, their evoked potentials start to explode, their amygdala starts firing like a volcano. Um, they get a, an adrenaline rush so they can't process because you know what happens when you're threatened and scared. Um, their working memory and ability to think things through gets disrupted so they don't get that cortical cognitive inhibition. Think about managing relationships 
when every time someone up has an angry face or feels like they have an angry face, your entire limbic system and, and sympathetic nervous system explodes. This is unique to folks with borderline disorder. We do not see this pattern in bipolar. So in terms of the tools that we have to, um, to distinguish um, the two, this is one of the ones that we have. Oh, okay, other things that um, they are challenged in is what we call the theory of mind. Theory of mind is, is a little bit of a nebulous concept, but it's important. Um, theory of mind means the ability of any human being to be able to acknowledge and accept that another human being has their own feelings, their own thoughts, their own opinions, their own goals, hopes, dreams, and desires. And number one, those are separate from yours. And number two, they can hold those and still like you. Okay, so it's kind of important to have a theory of mind to have healthy relationships. Um, it's an area where folks with borderline really struggle. The other area is in, the, is in the realm of empathy. And I need to qualify this. This is another example of unfortunate terminology. When we talk about folks with borderline disorder having increased empathy, it's not the kind of healthy, compassionate empathy that we think about. It's more um, what we would consider to be sort of an enmeshment or a codependent or a getting so bound up with another person's feelings that they lose that, um, that boundary and sometimes even lose reality testing. Um, again, that theory of mind that's another area that, cl that clinically separates borderline folks from bipolars. Um, this was a lovely study looking at an amazing variety of factors and doing a compare and contrast. These yellow areas are pinpointing the ones that kind of do give us some clinical distinction. Um, one is with the mood swings. When a patient tells you, my mood can swing 20 times in a day, um, that patient doesn't have bipolar two. That patient doesn't have cyclothymic disorder. That patient probably has borderline disorder. The big unknown is where does this kind of hyperthermic personality um, borderline spectrum um, concept that A. Kiskal describes fit in there? But with our nosology, that tends to be a little bit discriminatory. And the quality of the mood swings, um, if, when a person has bipolar disorder, their mood swings generally are irritability, elation, happiness, irritability, depression. Um, with a folk with borderline disorder, it tends to be more mixed up with anger or anxiety. Although our patients may not always be able to identify that. Um, impulsivity, this is, this is theoretical. It's not going to help you. Okay. Um, impulsivity is huge in both groups. There is a very, very robust body of data that says the nature of the impulsivity is different with folks with bipolar disorder and borderline, um, with people with borderline disorder, the impulsivity is generally having an affective response and then having a motor response and doing something without thinking it through. This is the patient where you just sit there and wanna to say to the patient, what in the world were you thinking about? With bipolar folks, the impulsivity tends to be more just from distractibility and lack of attention, you know, squirrel. From a research standpoint, this is really, really robust. From a clinical standpoint, it's not all that helpful because it's not generally easy to ferret those out clinically. Um, history of trauma is not really a good discriminatory um, data point for us. Um, it, is, it is more ubiquitous in folks with borderline disorder, but it's present in a whole lot of folks with bipolar 
illness. So we can't use it with a discriminatory function. And there are, awful, there are an awful lot of borderline folks out there that did not have traumatic childhood. Um, so it, obviously it's an important part of the history, um, but not necessarily helpful. Um, in terms of the maladaptive self schemas, if you look at that, they are all prominent in borderline disorder, much less so in bipolar. Um, the, the abandonment construct, the abandonment fear is the most clinically relevant one of all of those self schemas, um, primarily because even the most insightless, self-aware patient with borderline disorder can generally identify if they worry about people leaving um, and can generally identify that, yeah, I took that overdose right after my girlfriend told me that she was going to break up with me because that's the one um, that folks can identify. This is, remember I told you about my uh, friend Vassar Chenik, this is from him as well. This is just a, a schematic of all of the things, for lack of a better word, that are tied to the neurocircuitry and neurobiology of borderline disorder, um, patterns, symptoms, etc. The ones in yellow are clinical items that you can that you can identify from talking to patients or from talking to their families that really do set borderline disorder from um, bipolar disorder. The emotional salience, that's the thing that, that I was talking about earlier about being uber attuned to, to angry looking faces. Okay. So this is a challenge. You know, it's, uh, it's separating them is, uh, is a little bit different. And in a, we know in about 20% of folks, they're comorbid and we can't really separate it. You know, so it's challenging because the diagnoses keep or the criteria keep changing. There's so much symptom overlap. Um, getting a temporal, a good temporal history for hypomania is very, very hard. Um, people don't tend to remember it years past. So in psychiatry, and I am dangerously close to the end of my remarks here, just uh, in psychiatry, we don't have a blood test. We don't have a pathognomonic imaging. Um, we don't have a magic wand. Um, we have some really, really good screening instruments with um, some with significant predictive value. Okay. And, you know, reality has to intrude. Screening instruments are a huge help if we're going to manage um, and diagnose patients in a time effective manner, but they do have some limitations. Um, this is a very, very common screening instrument that you've probably seen called the mood disorder questionnaire. Um, it's actually well validated. It's used in a lot of research studies. Um, it is a very, it's, it's an instrument with a really, really high degree of sensitivity. So if you use this, you are never going to miss a patient who's at high risk for bipolar disorder. The problem is its level of specificity is not that great. In the research, it runs anywhere from 25% to 75%. That's a big spread. And there was once really interesting study that looked at a whole bunch of folks that were diagnosed as bipolar with the with this instrument and did um, structured interviews with them and about a third of those individuals were diagnosed with bipolar 2 and a third of those individuals were by were diagnosed with borderline disorder so use this um, in pers in perspective um, this is a screening instrument that might have some traction over time. Is anyone familiar with the five factor theory of personality? It is, it's, it's not new. It's been around for years. Um, the, the general concept is instead of dividing folks personality into buckets like cluster A, B, and C, personality is made up of how we behave in a number of diff different domains. And the large um, areas are like identity, self-direction, intimacy, um, and empathy. 
I don't know if you guys still read Freud, but one of the most enduring things that Freud said that actually was true um, was that the measure of a person's mental health is our ability to love and to work. So those four things um, lead up to that. And then there are a number of domains that I'm not going to go into over time that are really associated with lack of functioning. Um, and so there, like, there's, um, oh, golly, probably 50 to 100 different facets of personality functioning um, that really do seem to be predictive. Um, a number of really, really bright research, researchers have pulled out about 50 to 70 um, of those that have good predictive value for diagnosis of borderline disorder. So this instrument that I have on the screen is a 220 item instrument, just looking at personality dysfunction in general. And then a number of items have been identified that really do seem to predict borderline disorder. Not practically useful this week because they have not been, the validation studies aren't done and they haven't been all pulled into one instrument. Um, but watch this space. I think this is going to be useful for us down the line. So interestingly enough, the things that the two things that I use that are the most clinically useful screening tools are not validated at all. This is an instrument called the mood check. It was developed by a, a psychiatrist named Jim Phelps, who does an awful lot of work in uh, bipolar disorder. It's a front and back sheet. It has every single historical sign, symptom, pattern, et cetera, that has been described for bipolar spectrum from bipolar one to that fuzzy um, hyperthermic side. It's all on one page. The level of shading basically is a higher dose um, if, if you think about it. So you can have your patient fill this out and with one glance, you can just kind of see how many historical data points they carry about bipolar spectrum and how much you should really, really delve in, delve in and devote the time with the clinical interview. And also with one glance, you can get a feel for what the level of risk your patient is for getting um, stimulated and hypomanic on an antidepressant because we don't like that to happen. So the last unvalidated thing, um, which is amazingly useful, is when I do have patients who have a lot of symptoms of borderline disorder, and I kind of think that's probably where they are, um, I will give them this book to read, which is as relevant now as it was in 1980-something when it was first written. It's short it's timeless, even a person who's um, having problems with, with concentration and focus can get through it. Um, so if I tell a patient, you have a lot of symptoms of this thing we call borderline disorder, I'd like you to read this book and let's discuss it. If they come back to me and say, Dr. Brocade, this man has described me. Okay, I consider that pretty much pathognomonic. Plus it really helps us focus okay, what are the parts that spoke to you and where do we need to focus our efforts to help you function a little more um, happily? All right, so lots of overlap. You knew that before I started talking. Um, our concept is in evolution. There are some things, clinically uh, available things that can help you. So it's the, the trigger, the duration of the mood swings, the avoidance of abandonment, the emotional salience, those probably have good clinical discriminatory function. And my last thought to leave to you is this is what makes our lives maybe not fun, but certainly never. Um, and when we do help patients, either with clear cut bipolar disorder or borderline disorder, um, it's, it's slow, it's baby steps, but it is incredibly gratifying. All right, so thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'd be happy to entertain any questions, discussions, or comments that you might have.
feel free to type in the chat box or just speak up. But I'll start with a question, Dr. Broquet. Oh. What, aside from DBT, what um, medication treatment do you find is most effective for borderline patients? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, I have to define the term effective. Um, if our definition of effective is results in my patient either being symptom-free or having a significant noticeable reduction in their level of subjective angst and depression, the answer to that would be nothing, okay? If my, if my definition of effective is tones down their impulsivity, volatility, um, anger trigger enough to allow them to use, to learn and use mindfulness tools, really think about breathing before they cut themselves, that kind of thing. Um, in terms of what the data shows, SSRIs um, do, have, do have a role. Carbamazepine probably has got one of the strongest data data um, bases. Catiapine, I don't know, I think catiapine might even be um, above carbamazepine now in the, in the data. I, you know, when I was preparing for this, I read one article that made a reference to um, empirical support for lamotrigine as a good mood stabilizer in folks with borderline disorder, but I didn't have time to go pull the original um, information on that. I can and that is, oh, this is such a, a, a challenge because with the exception of SSRIs, all those other drugs are not benign drugs. And it's something that I struggle with a whole lot, especially with young people who are diagnosed with borderline who are suffering, but you know, not suicidal, not ending up in the hospital. Um, it's like, do you wanna start them on a road of, of atypical antipsychotics or valproate or, or carbamazepine or something like that. But with that said, though I know we can't set guidelines by anecdotes, but you know, you could tell I've been around a long time and I work with a lot of patients with borderline disorder. Um, I have three that stick in my head whose lives were absolutely changed. One with catiapine, one with ECT, one with um, loracidone. So whenever I start to think, oh, maybe we're leaning too much on medications, um, those, they're all, always, all these three patients were women. Those women get in my head and I say, oh, maybe, maybe we should talk about medications. Thank you. Any other questions for Dr. Roque? I had a quick question for you. My internet has been kind of spotty, so I apologize if I missed this. Okay. You talked about the neurophysiology, or at least what we know right now, when it comes to bipolar. And I remember you mentioned the insula and one other branch. And I'd asked this question on the wards before, and the response I got was, we know nothing about what happens in the brain with bipolar. And from your talk, you get the sense that we have some idea. So I was just curious what the current understanding is of these different brain structures that may be affected and how that translates to the clinical. Okay, I'm going to give you an unsatisfactory answer to that. What we can say is that there is a significant amount of data of neuroimaging that in folks with bipolar disorder, the most consistent and noticeable volume reductions are in the anterior cingulate and the insula. Okay, you know association does not equal cause and effect, right? So does that mean that those changes the things that we can look at with our current technology, is that what drives bipolar symptoms, patterns, et cetera? I don't know that. Um, but if it shows up on a test, an insula or anterior cingulator in the answer, you wanna circle those. Thank you. We probably have time for one more question. 
Hi, um, thank you so much for talking today. I apologize if you already answered this, um, but I was wondering if for like primary care doctors or maybe um, you know, whoever's like the first line physician that's seeing a patient, um, how would you, um, I guess, screen or figure out whether to give a patient an antidepressant like an SSRI without the fear of maybe kicking into a, a, a manic um, episode before, if they're undiagnosed bipolar? Yeah. Um, well, you guys are keep asking the, the hard unanswered <laughs> question. <laughs> you know, in the big spic, in the big pick, that's an excellent question. But I want to put it in context because in the big picture, our larger problem is helping primary care doctors get comfortable assertively treating depression. Um, one of the thing, one of the remember we talked about how there's a lot of public service and public. Um, education about bipolar and it's kind of fuzzy. Um, however, one of the good things though is it's raising people's awareness and primary care doctors watch the same television commercials. Um, so as a, as, a, as a whole, primary care doctors are much, much more attuned to the possibility that their patient might have that bipolar disorder. You know, I caught the, I caught the, uh, the last um, end of um, David Clayton's talk and he was talking about the, the primary thing is the availability of treatment. Um, and we know among primary care, the most effective thing in helping folks um, screen and, bipol and, and diagnose bipolar disorder is, is there someone there to, to help them? Because these are really hard patients. Um, so the most effective thing that we try to do from a systems level is get enough psychiatrists out into communities so that primary care folks have, have a backup. Um, but a lot of it is just education. Thank you. Well, thank you for speaking to us on this really interesting topic and confusing topic to say the least, uh, Dr. Broquet. Um, okay. Dr. Broquet has also kindly put her contact information in the program. If you have further questions for her, I'm sure she would be happy to answer them. Yeah, absolutely. And whatever you guys do with your lives, um, and I hope it's psychiatry, um, good luck and go out and change the world. Bye-bye.